Hey everyone, this is David Brown with the migration update for the first half of November 2025 from the Ashland Hawk Watch in Northern Delaware, USA. As you can see from the photo, coming into this last month of the season, we're getting some frosty mornings. First, let's take a look at some bird photos and then we'll go over the totals from the past two weeks. Let's start off with this hawk where we see it doesn't have a super long tail like we see on a sharp shinned hawk or a cooper's hawk. So we should be thinking a beautio. And this time of year, that means either red shouldered hawk or red tailed hawk. And if we look at the shoulder area of this bird, it does not have dark patagial bars and it does not have a distinct belly band and a clean upper breast, but rather it has streaking that starts on the upper breast and goes all the way down. So this is a juvenile red shouldered hawk. We've been seeing huge flocks of common grackles moving around and landing in the trees and especially early in the mornings. Sometimes we're getting really large groups streaming over with tens of thousands of common grackles. Here we have a large dark raptor with a large head. This is an eagle. And if we look at where the white is, we see a lot of white throughout the wing pit area as well as the underside of the body, letting us know that this is a bald eagle. And if we look at this bird, you can see that there are some feathers in the wings that stick out further than the others. These are actually retained juvenile feathers. In its first year of life, bald eagles have longer feathers, and as those feathers get replaced, the feathers that replace them are shorter. So this is a second year bird, and you can see the feathers that are the remaining first year feathers that it had. Compare that to this juvenile or first year bald eagle. So this is one that was probably born this spring or summer. And if we look at the trailing edge of the wings, we see that all of the feathers are the same length because they're all the same age and none of them have been replaced yet. And this tail is a little bit worn for how young this bird is. So it must've gotten itself in a little bit of trouble. Here we have another hawk and we see those rounded wing tips rather than the pointed wing tips of a falcon. And we see that this hawk has a really long tail. So we should be thinking either Cooper's hawk or sharp shinned hawk. And in this case, this bird looks somewhat lanky overall, and we see a brown head and then brown streaking that's teardrop shaped and concentrated more heavily on the upper breast, which is classic plumage for a juvenile Cooper's hawk. Here we have a small raptor perched in a tree and we can see some dark streaking to the breast. We see a dark cap to the head and a white eye line, and we see a dark tail with thin white bands. This is a falcon. This is a merlin. Compare that to this bird, which is about the same size, but it's actually a different species. And if we look at some of the differences, we see a more brown head on this bird, maybe a little bit of a white eye line. We see brown streaking down the front of the bird, but the tail is also very different. On this bird, we see sort of blue and gray bands where the gray bands are the larger ones. This is a sharp shinned hawk in juvenile plumage. Here we have a hawk coming overhead in a glide, and on this bird, immediately we see a dark belly band and very large dark patagial bars. This is an adult red-tailed hawk, and because of how heavily marked it is, this is probably from the northern or abieticola subspecies that we see this time of year. Here we have another hawk with a long tail, so perhaps you can stop and think, is this a Cooper's hawk or a sharp shinned hawk? First of all, looking at the plumage, we see orange barring underneath, so we know that this bird is an adult. We see overall a small head, and if we look at the tail, it's not even a square tip to the tail, it's a very notched tip to the tail, which is usually a good sign for a sharp shinned hawk, especially the males, which are the smallest ones. They're often the ones that show the square tip or even a notched tip like this. So adult sharp shinned hawk, probably a male. Here we have another hawk with a long tail. Is this a sharp shinned hawk or a Cooper's hawk? Looking at this bird, if we immediately look at the tail, we see that the outer tail feathers are slightly shorter than the central tail feathers. And a lot of times when we say that outer tail feathers are shorter, that refers to a Cooper's hawk, but let's look at some other features of this bird. If we just look at the overall shape impression of this bird, it doesn't really look big and lanky. It looks rather compact. And a lot of that's because of the bulging secondary feathers. So the wings look kind of short and bulging. The head on this bird, I would say, is relatively small. And if we look at the underside plumage, we don't see the orange barring that we saw on that previous sharp-shinned hawk. So this is not an adult, but rather we have 
brown streaking underneath, but it's not that thin teardrop streaking that we saw earlier on the Juvenile Cooper's Hawk. This is a really thick, blobby brown streaking to the underside of this bird. So with the overall shape of this bird and that underside plumage, I would say that this is a sharp-shinned hawk, and this could possibly be a female. They're the ones that sometimes show that more Cooper's Hawk-like tail, where the outer tail feathers are a bit shorter than the central ones. So, juvenile, sharp-shinned hawk, possibly a female. Here's a cool non-bird sighting that we had. This is a Boeing 787. That is the presidential plane of the country of Tajikistan, which was on its way to Washington, D.C. Here we have a hawk in that classic hawk soaring posture, so we should be thinking the Budeo genus. Looking at this bird, it has a very distinctive orange plumage to the underside of the body, and we see black and white banding to the flight feathers of the wings and the tail. The tail especially is black with thin white bands, making this an adult red-shouldered hawk, which is a very common species to be migrating in the first half of November. Here we have a hawk with a very distinctive shape and coloration. So first of all, talking about the shape, we see a long tail. We see wings that are held up into a, what we might call modified dihedral, meaning it goes up and then flattens out. And they're very thin pointed wings. Looking at the color of this bird, we see a gray head and otherwise a lot of white to the underside of the body and the underside of the wings. We have a dark trailing edge to the secondaries and dark wing tips as well. This is the adult male plumage of the Northern Harrier. Here's a non-raptor that's kind of a medium-sized bird that's blue and white with a very large, thick bill. This is a bird that likes to perch and dive into water. It is a belted kingfisher, and we know it's a male because it only has the blue breast band, whereas females would also have brown. Here we have a very asymmetrical turkey vulture coming straight at us, and this is probably due to an injury that healed, but it seemed to be flying perfectly fine. But definitely there's a problem with this left wing. It's getting towards the end of when we see any swallows at all, but the latest swallows that we usually see are tree swallows like this one, which are blue on top and white underneath. And if you look, they're white all the way from the throat, throughout the entire body and the undertail. So they flash a bright white and they don't really show any color at all to the underside. And I point all that out because when I looked up and saw this swallow, it very obviously does have some color to the underside, especially this orange throat. And I immediately knew it was a cave swallow. And the reason I knew that was there was a bit of a cave swallow event going on. And this is a species that is a bit unusual in that they come from the desert southwest. They come from Texas and Mexico. And sometimes in November, they do this migration where they come up the middle part of the country, loop around the Great Lakes, and then come down the Atlantic coast. So it's a species that's annual along the coast, especially at Cape May. And they had been seeing a lot of them. And there were a few reports from along the coast downstate in Delaware. And then the day that this photo was taken, there had been some reports near Philadelphia. So we knew to be on the lookout for cave swallows, even though they had never been seen at Ashland before. But we were lucky enough and two of them flew over and I got to get some photos. In fact, it seemed like they were sticking around, so I called down to the Nature Center and some people were able to come up and we had one give a really nice flyby. And again, you can see that they do have white to the underside of the body and a little bit to the under tail, although it is kind of a short, dark tail. It's not a forked tail like we usually see on the tree swallows. But the most distinctive thing is going to be this orange throat and face, at least when you're viewing from the underside. If you're lucky enough to get a view of the top side, they look somewhat similar to the cliff swallows that we see in the summer. If you look, it has an orange rump, but cliff swallows have kind of a darker red face, whereas the cave swallows like this one have an orange face that contrasts with the blue on top of the head. So there's more contrast between those two colors on the face and the forehead color is also different. But we don't really see many cliff swallows during the hawk watch. I don't think we've seen any at all, in fact, this fall. So if you see a swallow like this in November, it's probably going to be a cave swallow. You can probably tell that this photo wasn't taken at the Ashland Hawk Watch, but instead on my day off, I took a trip because on Sunday night, a photographer had posted photos of a sharp-tailed sandpiper that 
they had photographed at Bombay Hook National Wildlife Refuge, and word started to spread among the birding community. So on Monday morning, Kim and I made the decision to drive down to Bombay Hook and see if we could find the bird. And sure enough, it was very cooperative in the north end of the Sheerness Pool at Bombay Hook, and it was a life bird for both of us. So this is a species that's not even a European vagrant. This is an Asian vagrant. They come from Siberia. So this was a bird that was, uh, this is a juvenile. So born this spring or summer over probably in Russia. And I read that the juveniles actually hop over to Alaska and then migrate south to, I think, New Zealand and Australia. So really cool long distance migrant. And it's something that shows up in Delaware, maybe once every five to 10 years. It's not unprecedented, but it's definitely one of the highest levels of rarities that shows up in the state. So really cool to get down there. Um, the closest equivalent um, that we have normally is the pectoral sandpiper, but you can see that this bird's pretty distinctive with this rufous cap and the orange wash to the breast. So really distinctive bird. It was extremely cooperative, pretty close to the road and has stuck around a few days. There were no reports from today because Bombay Hook was closed for hunting, but uh, up until yesterday, people were still seeing this bird. So it's likely it's still around. And while we were there at Bombay Hook, someone else spotted this barnacle goose, actually from the same location that the sharp-tailed sandpiper was being seen. And this is likely the same individual that will be in this area now for the third winter. It likes to hang out in this one pond in Smyrna, but occasionally the flock of Canada geese that it hangs out with wanders over to Bombay Hook. So we were happy to see this European vagrant just across from the Asian vagrant. You can only keep a hawk watcher away from the hawks for so long, so back to Ashland on a very windy day that very few people were visiting, and it was very cold as well. Here is a raptor high overhead. We have a completely dark raptor. This was a large bird. This is an eagle, and if we look at the overall shape, because we don't really have any plumage details to help us. There's no white in the wing pits. There's no white in the center of the wings. There's no white at the base of the tail. All we really have to go off of is the silhouette. And we can see that this bird has a relatively small head compared to the length of the tail. So this is indeed a golden eagle. And it was the first golden eagle we had seen in about two and a half weeks. We had some uh, early golden eagles in October, October 16th and 17th, and then a number, another one like a week later. And then coming into the peak time for them that last week of October, first week of November, we just weren't getting them. So finally starting to get some golden eagles again. And this bird is likely an adult since we don't see any of the white in the wings or base of the tail. Now, some younger birds don't have the white in the wings, but most of them will. And almost all of the goldens that we see at Ashland do have the white in the wings. So a little bit unusual to get a golden eagle in this adult-like plumage at the Ashland Hawkwatch. Here we have a really pretty bird that I'm always happy to see. This bird's yellow underneath with a black bib, very short tail with white outer tail feathers and a very distinctive shallow kind of stuttery flap. This is an Eastern Meadowlark. And one last bird photo. Here we have a relatively large raptor with pointed wings. We should be thinking a large falcon. And there's only one large falcon we get, and that is the peregrine falcon, the fastest animal on the planet. You can see this distinctive facial pattern and kind of helmeted look to the head. And we know it's an adult because of the horizontal barring to the underside of the body. And you can see it has a quite different tail than we saw in the Merlin earlier. Remember, Merlins have kind of a dark tail with thin white bands. With the peregrines, it's kind of uh, gray and darker bluish bands on the tail. So really cool to get some peregrines. Um, it had been slow for them, I feel like, but we're starting to get a, a decent number of them. I think we're up to 11 now for the season. So um, the average is about 20. Uh, so we really enjoy every peregrine we get because we really don't get a ton of them. A few nights ago, there were rumors of auroras. So Kim and I went up to the Hawk Watch after dark and had some beautiful views of Aurora Borealis. And I especially like this photo where you have the red and green, perfect for coming into the Christmas season. And I like how the clouds also add some texture and perspective to it. Taking a look at hawk count for the totals from the first two weeks of November for the Ashland Hawk Watch. You can see overall we've had a lot of moderate flights with 
a lot of days, you know, 75 birds, 100 birds, 125 birds. The peak day was just over 200. A couple slower days, you can see we had a day with only 14, but we've had a total of 1,275 migrants, bringing us to a season total of just under 10,000. So we'll probably break the 10,000 mark tomorrow. Looking at the individual species totals, black vultures have been pretty low. For most of the period, I wasn't even counting any as migrants, and really we're only seeing maybe 10 or 15 a day. Did count some as migrants in the past recent days. Turkey vultures have been pretty steady with moderate flights most days, about 700 for the month so far and over 3,000 for the season. There's still been a couple ospreys trickling through, but I'd be surprised if we see any more. With bald eagles, we had one big day with 24 migrating, but otherwise a lot of sort of moderate days, five to 10 eagles. Although we're seeing a lot fly around, just not a lot migrating. We've been seeing small numbers of harriers still coming through as many as five in a day, nothing super spectacular, but we've had some nice looks at adult males. Coopers and sharp shinned hawks, we're getting a few every day, but their numbers are starting to dwindle as well. Although we seem to have some settled in that we see hunting every day. For red-shouldered hawks, overall it seems like it's kind of low, and I think that's probably most just to do with the weather. Only 130 so far for November. Um, it'll be interesting to see if that number picks up, but you can see we had a day with 40. Today we had 20, um, but a lot of days we're getting less than 10. So this is really uh, should be peak period for the red shoulders, but it seems like we're just not getting them, possibly because of a lot of days with stronger winds. Red shoulders really like days with light northeast winds, and that's a uh, wind direction we really haven't had this month. We did have one late broadwing on the 7th, one of only a handful of November records of broadwing. Red tails, kind of like red shoulders, they're a little bit low probably compared to where they should be. We've had a couple decent days. You can see we had a day with 47, but really most days, if you, know, if you get 10 or 15, you consider it a good day. Golden Eagle, we went through the entire first 10 days of November without a golden eagle. Finally, on the 11th, we had two of them. And then on the 13th, we had another one. So we've had three so far for November, but really we should be more in the range of getting 10 for November. And usually when we get them, they're in the first half of November. Usually we only get one or two in the second half. So hopefully we'll get some more, but um, really a lot of years, this is the time where we only get one or two more after this. So it might end up being a somewhat low year for goldens. And falcons are usually pretty low in November. We had one kestrel, getting some merlins, a total of 10. And we've had three peregrines, which is actually pretty good for November. So overall, um, you know, a lot of days we're having fun. We're getting decent conditions. A couple days have been very, very windy. And there's some more very, very windy days coming up as well. Um, we'll just see what happens in the second half of November. Maybe since it was a little bit slow in the first half of the month, now that it's starting to get cold up north, maybe that'll push some birds south. Definitely starting to see the golden eagle numbers pick up in the Pennsylvania Ridge sites. And we'll just have to see what happens with those and definitely keep an eye on what's going on with these red shoulders. It's been low for us and also low for Quaker Ridge in Connecticut, which we're usually the top two hawk watches for them. So maybe they're just a little late coming down this year. All right, the Ashland Hawk Watch continues daily through the end of November at the Ashland Nature Center in Hokesson, Delaware, USA. So maybe you can come out and join us before the season ends. From Lyco Birds, this is David Brown. Thanks for watching.